Hello everyone, I'm Kevin, otherwise known as Form BX257, here to bring you another 1980s G.I. Joe tour review, and today I'll be taking a look at the Cobra Mobile Cannon, the 1987 Maggot, and its driver, the Worms. Now, like a lot of 1987 and 1988 characters and vehicles, this did not make any cartoon appearances. But they both make their first comic book appearance in the old Mobile comic run of G.I. Joe in issue number 68. Although the tank alone made a background cameo the previous issue. Now, as far as I can tell, Maggot does not actually stand for anything. However, the Worms does. It stands for Weapons Ordnance Rugged Machine Specialist. The Maggot is one of those toys that gives off the vibe of being a much larger vehicle than it actually is. Now granted, with the cannon overhangs, it is a little bit over 15 inches long. However, it's only about 5 inches wide by about 7 inches high. So, while it does have great shelf presence, it doesn't take up much on the shelf, which is a good thing for display. I'm just going to remove the driver just so that I can focus on the maggot's features by itself. Now the front drive section is hinged rather unusually to the rest of the vehicle. It has a hinge which goes left to right on one portion, so that the drive section can, can do this. Which is cool because it looks like it's kind of steering the rest of the vehicle, but it also has a hinge which goes up and down so you get, well, this type of action. I guess if you have this thing on uneven surface, it kind of looks like it's going off-road, which is, I guess, pretty cool. The front drive section also has a front cannon, which is actually hinged on this uh, crow's nest type turret, which kind of limits the way this thing uh, goes side to side, but, well, I guess that's okay, because it also has a secondary cannon here. And this cannon goes up and down, and it's on a turret which is hooked onto the radar dish, so they both go around and uh, go up and down in sync. Unfortunately, it can't go all the way around because it does kind of hit the back of this portion when this portion is on, but I'll get to that in just a moment. The radar dish itself can turn around independently. Beside that, You have an opening engine cover to show some engine detail. On the bottom of these fake treads, we have some dumbbell wheels here. Two on the other side over there as well. The driver's seat, meant for one obviously, actually has a lot of detail in there. It's very cramped, and you don't normally would see that on most angles. Now, taking a look at the cannon on the back portion, this thing is massive. And it actually has quite a few ratchets. Very soft ratchets, but ratchets nonetheless. That's one. That's two. That's three. That's four. And that's five. So this thing goes from pretty much horizontal to almost vertical. That's pretty impressive, I would say. The upper half of the cannon portion is also its own turret. Now this is going to be a little bit difficult because the turret itself is not really uh, sort of pegged in here. It's just sort of held in there by friction and gravity. So you'll have to forgive me if this looks a little bit clumsy. But this whole thing can swivel around. like this. In the cannon command area, we have some seating for a gunner in this uh, round, almost pit-like seat. There aren't any actual handholds for the uh, back of the can, but that's okay because the seat itself has a lot of molded on detail, monitors, buttons and switches and computers and whatnot. Behind that, however, is this uh, oddly angled seat. And that's what this joystick is for. It's for, the, uh, for whoever sits here. Of course, that's facing yet another monitor, 
And I guess it's up to your imagination as to what this person controls. Underneath that is a really odd open space. That is kind of unfortunate. It's uh, sort of meant for the other mode, which I'll get to right now. Now the front drive section and the back portion are held together by that uh, hinge, but the hinge is actually made of C-clips. So what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to disconnect it like that. Now that may have seemed a little bit easy, but these C-clips actually work very well. I'm actually surprised at how well engineered and how sturdy that connection was, despite this being a 30 plus year old toy. Now what you have here is now a little scout vehicle. And while you could just leave the back portion just like this, it's perfectly fine and actually rather stable despite the huge uh, cannon going way over forward here like this. It's not really that unbalanced. But like I said before, the top half of the, port, the turret is not actually permanently clicked into the bottom half. It's just friction and gravity held in there. So you can just pop it right out. And it has these legs for support. So this can be its own little base. And these just fold down. And there you have it. And this portion, well, it's just ready to go just like that. The drive section or scout vehicle in this mode is infinitely easier to hold on to and demonstrate in this size. And as you can see, this is what the hinge looked like, and it goes from side to side here. I know to take a closer look at the command module, which was unfortunately hidden by the turret being right on top of it. Underneath, like the drive section, it has these two little dumbbell wheels, which help the non-rolling treads actually roll. And this is what the uh, hinge looks like from this side. It actually rotates all the way around on th this plane. And that's pretty much it. This thing really doesn't do anything. It doesn't have any weapons or anything like that. It does have, however, have a massive amount of detail. Rather unfortunate that it's not picked out with any like stickers or anything. I'm actually kind of surprised at that, but I checked the uh, sticker sheet and as well as the uh, instruction sheet and there's nothing which is meant to go on here But it still looks really nice now in the middle here. There is one foot peg So uh, at least one figure is sort of, sort of monitoring and pushing buttons and switches and whatnot There are two little joysticks here. So I guess you can pretend that this thing does something and as well as there are two more foot pegs back here Either for figures just sort of, uh, I guess, standing, hanging out, or whatever. But there's also indents on the sides here. So I'm sort of assuming that these are actually little seats. So you can actually pretend this is a kind of a, I guess, a really light personnel carrier. With two figures just sort of, I guess, looking at each other. And another figure just sort of playing Galaga back here. So I've hooked the rear command section up to the front drive section just to give it more of a personal carrier type of a look, but it really doesn't accomplish that goal because there's just not enough space for any figures to fit in there. Which is rather unfortunate because to me this whole front portion here with all the monitors and all the really nice detail seems like a kind of a wasted opportunity. A pop-up gun, a pop-up missile, maybe just leaving it hollow for more figures to fit in there. That's rather unfortunate that I can't really do anything. I really love the design of the maggot, despite the fact that the year that this thing is made in, and of course its name by itself, kind of makes you think that this should have been some sort of weird, organic, Cobra Law type vehicle. But it's not. It's very much in keeping with the old Cobra aesthetic, with very wedgy, big fat uh, treads on here, and really nice stylized guns. But a lot of people are going to say, well, they don't really like the sort of steel blue pops of yellow. Honestly, I don't really mind. I think it looks really good. Now, one thing you have to understand is that this thing is fairly easy to find on the aftermarket. 
despite the fact that, well, like I think it looks really good and it's fairly sturdy, it does have one major problem, which of course sort of bumps up the price. And that is this thing, the radar dish. For some strange reason, the radar dish is really very poorly engineered on here. I would say that a grand total of nine out of 10 maggots do not have their radar dish in there. They're mostly broken off. Now this is what a radar dish looks like perfectly complete, which is of course why I bought this thing. And this little shaft portion is something that you would rarely see on most maggots. Now I'm not exactly sure because I've looked into this hole and it looks perfectly fine. But I've noticed that if I push this thing all the way down, it, the bottom portion of the shaft actually catches on something, making it impossible to turn. And it, it looks like it ought to turn. I mean, it, it obviously does if you put it in just sort of like halfway and not all the way in. But when you turn it, it just sort of shears off the entire shaft of this radar dish. It's really unfortunate. And now, it's time for Does a Modern Figure Fit It In? As usual, I'll be using my 2009 Rise of Cobra Footloose figure as my example of a modern figure. And let's see if he fits in here. He fits perfectly there. He looks good in the standing position. He looks good in the seated position. There's barely enough room for him to sit here, but he still does sit here and rather securely. And even though modern figures can't make use of the old foot pegs, they don't get in the way of him standing where he needs to stand to look like he's actually doing something here. So just what would the opposite number to the maggot be on the G.I. Joe side? Well, being a mobile cannon, we can all really only compare it to another mobile cannon. Uh, what is more famous in that role than the 1984 Slugger with its driver, Thunder? As a matter of fact, I mentioned him specifically because, well, Thunder and the Worms actually do seem to be comparable as well as action figures. Now, as you can see, the well, the Slugger was a sort of a $10 range vehicle back in the day, meaning that it was a medium-sized vehicle. Whereas the Maggot was a $15 vehicle, which was a, just under a large size vehicle. So maybe toy-wise, they weren't really that comparable, but I would say that as far as what they're actually meant to do, uh, fire large shells of really long range, they were quite uh, the equals there. And now to take a look at the maggot's driver, the worms. He only came with one accessory, and that was his removable helmet. The helmet kind of reminds me of the Rocketeer's helmet, to be honest. That's a lot of painted detail on there, which is kind of unusual for a helmet of this time. It's a nice little Cobra symbol on the top there. But of course, the most distinctive feature of this helmet is the antenna on its side, which is, as you can see, very easy to pop off. I've had to change my entire camera angle here because this just would not focus on this tiny little piece. But I felt it was really important to show you that an original worm's antenna would actually match the plastic of the helmet. It shouldn't be any other color. If you have any other color besides this, then you probably have a reproduction and is worth, well, probably a fraction of what this thing is worth. As for the worm's outfit, I really like its design and even its color scheme. Now, I know a lot of people kind of don't like the whole pops of yellow thing, but I think it actually goes well with the maggot. The maggot had pops of yellow to go with the steel blue, and this has pops of yellow to go with the kind of 
warm brown, almost a caramel brown that he has here. Overall, I think it works. It, it, to me, at least, it doesn't really detract from the figure's overall aesthetic, and you can't really complain about the aesthetic because well, it's really cool. He has those kind of slouching gloves, but then he has this really cool like bomber jacket with a Sam Brown belt and like a little, what looks to me like a little scarf underneath there. It's very old fashioned, very stylized military. I really like that, especially with the uh, the long boots and all that. It just sort of, it just sort of reminds me of uh, a very old fashioned officer's outfit. But it does have some really unusual little um, details on here. Like on the face, he has this, this kind of like a hood, which kind of reminds me of how they did the Toxo Viper uh, head's hood with the like, little studs on it. It's really strange. Like I said, he had the Sam Brown uh, belt going across here. But he also has a skull and crossbones belt buckle, which is very unusual. And let's not forget his medals, a very, very unusual thing on a Cobra figure. He also has what look like officer stripes on his epaulots here. So maybe this guy was either supposed to be an individual or perhaps he was supposed to be an officer, an elite figure. Now, I'm just going to show you something really quick. This is the old 1986 Viper um, file card. And you'll notice that on the bottom here, it says that the Cobras, they don't really want rewards with parades or medals. They just want material goods. But I think that maybe only applies to anyone with the Viper suffix and all the other um, Cobras that have their own specific name are more invested in the Cobra way of doing things. So maybe these medals really are just that. They're, they're medals because he is really part of the Cobra culture and is high up there in the uh, Cobra hierarchy. And people say, well, maybe this guy was intended to be a G.I. Joe or something. No, I don't, I don't really think so. Not with that skull and crossbones uh, belt buckle. Another figure one of my favorites of all time is a Crimson Guard who actually does have medals on him, which a lot of people just tend to forget. Yeah, those are medals. They're not just badges. He wouldn't have badges all over him, of course. So of course, these two seem like they should be very much in the uh, sort of um, hierarchy of the Cobra Command. And then there's my pick for opposite number to the worms on the G.I. Joe side is the 1984 Thunder. Now, I know it was a little bit unusual to compare a 1984 uh, vehicle and figure set to something from 1987, as they wouldn't be contemporary on the shelves. But the Slugger and Thunder were actually still available from Hasbro through Mail-Away. So through 1987 to 1988, these things actually would have been um, contemporary, even if they weren't in the same retail market. Now, Thunder also has a very complicated helmet, although it actually, uh, all these little pieces actually stick onto the helmet quite a bit better than the Worms does. So you will actually find this uh, quite a bit more easily on the aftermarket. But another thing is, is that Thunder here is wearing a brown bomber jacket as well, a tank commander's jacket. Obviously, uh, a vehicle with the um, radar dish still intact and a figure with the antenna still on actually raises the price quite a bit. So, well, like I said, it's not it's not a particularly rare vehicle and figure combination to find on the aftermarket. You will often find them without those two things. So, putting these two things onto the vehicle and figure, of course, raises the price exponentially.
So you can focus on the maggot. There. Honestly, I kind of wish this was, well, I wish this, bleh. driving them have quite a few compare, bleh. Well, that's all the time I have right now. Please check out my Facebook page for more information and behind the scenes photos for these reviews. Thank you for watching this video and stay tuned for next time to see another 1980s G.I. Joe tour review. See you then.